Hi, Misha here, and kind of for 4th of July and whatnot, thought I would start talking about U.S. Navy ships, kind of get away from the Japanese and the British that I've been doing, also I've covered French and a few others, and really, you, you think of battleships, but that was the purview, mostly, of other navies. The U.S. Navy really came into its own with the aircraft carrier. And this is an overview video. I'll do more detailed looks at each of these at a later time. And I have three different classes of carriers out here from World War II. Over here we have the USS Saratoga of the Lexington class. These were really the, the first proper fleet carriers in the U.S. that kind of date back before and during the Washington Naval Treaty. In the middle we have the USS Enterprise of the Yorktown class. There were three of these in the class and these date very much to the treaty era and immediately after it. And then finally we have the most famous probably the Essex class which really goes to show you the might of the American industrial machine in the 1940s. And these would be Mass produced on a scale never really seen before or since. They would outlast World War II. They would outlast Korea. They would even outlast, in some instances, Vietnam. Finally, only being replaced by the, the large nuclear supercarriers later on. There would be a total of 24 in the class. In a way, 25 even. <laughs> Actually, of these, believe it or not, the Lexingtons were technically the heaviest. The Enterprise here of the Yorktown is technically the smallest, lightest, and the Essex was pretty well in the middle. But that's kind of a little bit deceptive based on their abilities. The one on the left is from Atlas Editions. The middle is from Eagle Moss, and the one on the right is from De Agostini. The two on the ends are one, one, excuse me, one, twelve hundred fifty scale, and the Eagle Moss in the middle is one eleven hundred scale. All three being diecast. Well, with that, let's just do a little brief talk about each one and their place in history and how World War II really prepared. America and propelled it to the forefront of naval power during the Cold War era. USS Saratoga, CV-03. The lead ship in the class, USS Lexington, was CV-02. And as you probably know, these began life when they were laid down after World War I as battle cruisers. America had been or the U.S. Navy, I should say, have been wanting to get newfangled battle cruisers for a long time, but various budget cuts and other funding things meant that it just didn't happen. In fact, the Lexington class battle cruisers had been planned for a very long time. They laid down six of them around 1919, 1920, but then the Washington Naval Treaty required that they be scrapped. An exception was given for the signatories to convert some ships already under construction into aircraft carriers for experimental testing training purposes. This is where you get things like the aircraft carrier Bjorn in France and you get Akagi and Kaga in Japan. So 
they would take the two ships that were most far along in construction, Saratoga and Lexington, and they would redo them as carriers, and they would go into service in 1927, being the first proper aircraft carriers in the U.S. Navy. There was the USS Langley, but she was very much a test ship. She was converted from a ore freighter, and she was CVO-1, so she was counted, but yeah, she wasn't a combat vessel. She was a testing vessel to figure out how to take off and land. These are the first ones that actually were practical. So what do we have? The Lexington class carriers were 888 feet long, 106 feet wide, and of that, 866 feet were flight deck, and nearly the entire width was also flight deck. She had a hangar that was 424 feet long, in between 68 and 74 feet wide, depending on where you were at, and it had a 20 foot ceiling. In fact, it was the largest enclosed space on any ship in the world at the time. She also was fitted, originally, with eight 8 inch guns. Four in front of the tower and four behind that was super fired, plus five inch guns for aircraft defense and other AA guns. The sticking point was her weight. Because she started off as a battle cruiser hull, she already had some weight down there. Now, under the Washington Naval Treaty, aircraft carriers were supposed to be limited to 27,000 tons standard. But an exception was made for these conversion ships because they knew that the hulls were already heavier. This allowed up to 33,000 tons. But even then, it still would not really be enough to have a practical ship. So, after a lot of lawyering, they found a loophole, supposedly, in the field for aircraft and submarine defense that allowed an additional 3,000 tons of standard weight, meaning these just squeaked in if you were, you know, thinking that was an honest use to the loophole. Otherwise, you could just say they just went with it. But yeah, standard weight was about 36,000 tons, with full full load at over 43,000 tons. Not small ships. Originally they had an air group of around 78, with 36 of those meant to be bombers. And one limiting factor was the fact that it was a converted battle cruiser, it, which meant her hangar space, her storage space, was a little on the limited side. It also limited the width of her flight deck. On the other hand, it meant she had pretty damn good torpedo defense, and she had good secure storage for things like aircraft bombs and, and whatnot. So she wasn't perfect, but considering the alternative was just a scrap, Saratoga and Lexington, they came out of it with two very effective carriers. And they would be able to squeeze more planes on board if you counted dismantled spares and, and planes that were kind of hung up in the hangar, something that would be repeated in later aircraft carriers. <laughs> it is worth pointing out that in 1940 they planned to get rid of the 8-inch guns because they were useless. And between, in 1942, they would start to do this with both of them. So by World War II, they, they lost their big guns. And, of course, they would install more and more anti-aircraft guns because that's really what a carrier needed. It was with the two Lexington classes that the U.S. Navy would really learn how to operate aircraft carriers, managing everything, takeoffs, landings, attacks, strategies. For example, in 1928, during a battle, a, a, a mock attack on the Panama Canal, the locks, they successfully defeated the defending force and showed the, the potential power of carriers there. In 
Then in 1938, they would have another Fox attack on the uh, port at Pearl Harbor, again showing what a sneak attack could do. And then when World War II began, December 7, 1941, Saratoga here was at port in San Diego, California, and Lexington was actually out to sea. They both, of course, would return and get new orders and uh, early on be used. The uh, Saratoga here would get torpedoed early in 1942, putting her out of action. For a bit. Lexington would get her first taste of combat, at least majorly, in February, but only be mildly damaged. And then she would rendezvous with the newer carrier Yorktown to do several raids on Japanese shipping and whatnot. Of course, she was famously at the Battle of Coral Sea, where they did sink the light carrier Shoho and damage a fleet carrier, but in turn Lexington was damaged and because of leaking fumes from fuel that were making the situation extremely dangerous and literally volatile, they were forced to scuttle her, sink her on May 8th. So a US destroyer torpedoed her and she sank. After that, Saratoga here would return to duty, being used in the Solomon Islands to support the Guadalcanal campaign and uh, she would be instrumental in sinking the Japanese light carrier Ryuho then she would get torpedoed again later being damaged and she would come back to support various landings and operations in 1943 but it was relatively quiet and then in 1944 she would actually Following that, she would start to participate in the Battle of Iwo Jima in early 1945, but then she would be damaged by kamikaze and sent back to the U.S. for repairs. And during this time, since she was an aging carrier, they would uh, permanently retrofit her into a training ship, put, turning part of her hangar deck into classrooms even. And she would be used as a training ship throughout the rest of 1945 until the end of the war and then after that she would be used as a transport to take US troops back home and then in 1946 she was part of Operation Crossroads that summer nuclear tests and she weathered the aerial test but then was severely damaged and eventually sunk because of the underwater test and she would sink off Bikini Atoll that July. So one carrier lost in 1942 and one voluntarily sacrificed for weapons tests in 1946. But yeah, not bad for America's first fleet carriers. And they were quite durable and quite capable considering the compromised state of their construction. And these were the largest carriers in US service up until the Midway class that came online in 1945. So kind of funny that even though they were so early they were so large but that's what happens when you build an aircraft carrier on a battle cruiser hull. And of course that led directly to the Yorktown class. The Yorktown class were purpose-built aircraft carriers and built with lessons learned from the Lexington class. But, they were also built with the constraints of the Washington Naval Treaty and the London Naval Treaty. And the U.S. only had 135,000 tons total for carriers. So they wanted something more capable, but were kind of restricted. They looked at a 23,000 ton design a larger 27,000 ton, but if they went with that, they could only really do one. What they ended up going with was a 20,000 ton standard, but 25,500 ton full load 
carrier. They could nevertheless, it was designed to carry 80 aircraft, and they could do 90, but keeping in mind, some of those would be disassembled spares. She was a little shorter at just under 825 feet, but she was wider, which gave a better flight deck, at just under 110 feet. And they didn't have the 8 inch guns this time. They considered doing a flush deck, no, no island, but they decided pretty quick that an island was a good thing. It had a lot of advantages, so why not? And so they put two into construction, CV-5, Yorktown, and CV-6 here, Enterprise. If you're wondering about CV-4, that was the little light carrier Ranger, which had been used for testing. And Ranger really showed you couldn't go too light with the carrier because she was so light that she wasn't really usable in most situations. And Ranger would actually spend the war in the Atlantic, mainly the Mediterranean. She wasn't suited really for operations in the Pacific. But um, yeah, they would build two of these during the treaty times. And as they were still getting them ready to go, once the treaty systems broke down, they would very quickly order a third member, which would become USS Hornet. She would become CV-08. If you're wondering about CV-07, well, that was actually USS Wasp. Because they did two 20,000 ton ships, they had some tonnage left over, and they decided to use it to make a scaled down version of the Yorktown class, which would become USS Wasp. They would also try some new technology, including a elevator mounted on the side of the flight deck instead of in the center on Wasp. But, um, yeah, interesting carriers, and again, not as large, but in some ways more capable because they were purpose-built as carriers. And the first two were very much in service at the beginning of World War II, with Hornet still working up and finishing its training, but it was completed. So, all three would be ready at the beginning. So, USS Yorktown would be used in early 1942 for various raids. But, of course, her first major action that's historic is the Battle of the Coral Sea. She was damaged there, but not in danger of sinking. She went back to Pearl Harbor for a quick patch job and was made ready very hastily for the Battle of Midway. All of these would be there. And planes from Yorktown and Enterprise would help sink the four Japanese fleet carriers, including Akagi and Kaka. But an already damaged Yorktown would take more damage. She would first be abandoned on June 4th. Then they would go back to try to salvage her. But on the 7th, she would... Uh, well, before that, she'd be hit by a Japanese submarine with torpedoes, and then finally sink on the 7th. So she was a tough ship, but she went down. Hornet, like I said, would be there as well. And then during the Guadalcanal campaign, during the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, she would be hit, damaged, and would ultimately sink on October 27th. So, yeah, Hornet had a very short career. Enterprise here, though, would actually live the war out, becoming the most decorated ship in uh, U.S., or at least World War II history. She would get the first naval kill of the war. She would, uh, she would be damaged here and there. For example, in the Guadalcanal campaign, she would be you know, her flight group would be transferred and help turn back the Japanese troop transports there, kind of ending the threat of them retaking the area. And then in 1943, she would go in for a relatively long refit from June to October, coming back out, being made ready, and then being used at 
all the fun places like the Battle of the Philippine Sea and the Leyte Gulf. And towards the end of the war, she would actually be used as a nearly always dedicated night fighting platform for pioneering use of night fighting aircraft. And uh, she would be damaged on May 14, 1945, by a kamikaze that would smash into her front elevator, destroying it, doing major damage to the hangar deck. So she had to go back to port for repair. And she was still undergoing repairs when the war ended in August. And after the war, she was uh, used for troop transport, bringing soldiers back home. And she would enter New York Naval Shipyard in January of 1946. And a year later, be decommissioned. They tried turning her into a na uh, museum ship, but it ultimately didn't happen, even though several attempts were done. So... In the late 50s, she was uh, broken up for scrap. I guess I should mention that Hornet, her big thing in April of 1942, she launched the Doolittle Raid, 16 special B-25s that were the first bombing attack on the Japanese mainland, homeland. So before she was sunk, she at least did get a little bit of come up and against Japan. But these ships, the York Towns and the Essex were made under the treaty system, except Essex Lexington. But the Essex were not. They were a whole other ball game. The Essex class was the most produced capital ship of the twentieth century and arguably the most successful since none were lost in combat. It dates back to the end of the treaty system in 1937. Plans started to be laid out. And in May of 1938, the Congress passed funding that would result in the building of the Yorktown USS Hornet and the first of the Essex class. They were planning on doing 10 of these initially, with the first ones ordered in 1940. And then the final of the first 10 ordered right after the beginning of World War II. And throughout 1942, 43, and even 44, more and more would be ordered. Ultimately, 32 would be ordered. Of those, 24 would be completed, plus a 25th that was completed to a revised design that was technically a different class. Six were discontinued. But, um, but yeah. It is a purpose-built carrier. It weighs a little under 31,000 tons standard and a little over 33,000 full. It originally was 872 feet long. Then they would introduce, after a few were built, an extended bow known as the long hull. And that would bring its overall length to the same as the Lexington's at 888 feet. She was designed to carry 90 to 100 modern aircraft. And what was good about the fact that she wasn't even started until the late 1930s and laid down till later was... She was designed with metal, mono-wing, modern aircraft in mind, not older wood and fabric biplanes. She started with CV-09 and just kind of went up from there. These use the edge-mounted, edge-of-the-deck-mounted elevator pioneered in the WASP. And they were built from the outset with air and surface search radar as well as modern radio equipment and friend and foe designating equipment. They had catapults, and older naval vessels had catapults, but they didn't really need them or use them. But with the Essex class, they actually started to use them towards the end of the war to launch, launch the larger aircraft like the TBF, TBM, Avenger, and SB-2 Helldiver.
and she had more and more anti-aircraft guns and just a better arrangement of her structure, surfaces, and equipment and she had better protection against torpedoes and better damage control facilities. Just all the lessons they had learned. And they also streamlined the class to be as easy and quick to mass produce as was practically possible. And that's why they cranked out a boatload of them during the war. The USS Essex and the early ships started to join the fleet in May of 1943 and would continue to do so throughout the war as more and more came online. Earlier carriers had been used either singly or maybe in small groups of two but with the Essex, because they had enough carriers, they started using them in what they called fast carrier groups, strike groups and these were often supported and supplemented by what were called jeep carriers or escort carriers, the independence class and so just overwhelming firepower and ability with these ships they could carry a lot of aircraft, they could deploy them quickly they could defend themselves against aircraft and if they were damaged they could take a hit and keep on going as evidenced, by, as evidenced by USS Franklin and USS Bunker Hill. But there's a lot to be said about the Essex class, so it'll be a big full video when I get to it, probably. <clears throat> but uh, this really was the backbone of the U.S. Navy at the end of World War II. It was supplemented by the Midway class, but there's only three Midways. So the Essex were still very much in service after the war. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. They started to try to mothball some of them in 1949, but then the Korean War happened and they were brought right back. Eleven were used in the Korean War. Thirteen were used in Vietnam. They were also deployed during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And as some it remained in service in one capacity or another until 1991, when they were finally uh, retired out. But when they had so many of them, and of course the ones at the end of the war, they had uh, nine total under construction when the war ended. So some of the ships were brand new. Out of the 24 that were completed, 14 only saw service in World War II. So 10 of them were practically brand new and uh, these were big enough and modern enough that they could adapt to the jet age and they were modified a total of 15 were modified to work with uh, the new fancy jets and late in life some were even modified with the new fangled angled aircraft deck landing you know flight deck So, very much a historic carrier, and really, the Essex class exemplifies why no matter what, Japan was probably not ever going to win World War II, not unless they could have maintained a, p a favorable peace by the end of 1942. But once these came online in 1943, and Congress was willing to purchase as many as it took to win, it was all over. So yeah, the, the final fleet carrier of World War II. But, but just an overlook here, just to talk about them, kind of put their contextualize into history. Again, I'll uh, look at each one individually, even talk about the aircraft they carried maybe on that video. But it's felt like doing this tonight. So if you have any questions or comments, please post them below. With that, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.